Hello everyone, welcome. Um, so I chose a bit of a clickbaity title, please apologize, <laughs> let me apologize, um, but uh, I wanted to talk a bit about the kind of things because that you see when a compiler generates code, because I realize not that many people actually look regularly at what their compiler actually produces. And I think some people have a bit of a wrong idea of how good compilers actually are or where their failings are and so on. So that's what I want to present a bit to give you an idea. And of course, please interrupt at any time. Um, there will be some assembler code, so if you don't understand it, please ask. Um, I'll try to explain it and you shouldn't need to understand every detail of the assembler code. It's just how many instructions it is, <laughs> um, but still. Um, so, uh, as I said, what I want to show is examples where the compiler generates code that is not going to perform well, and um, mostly simple examples, um, because it is supposed to show you how a compiler is actually different than a human. Because a human wouldn't manage to actually convert a 20 megabyte code base into a sampler code without making any mistakes. Um, and on that topic, this is not about blaming compiler developers or something like that. Um, because in general, the code quality is really good. I mean, I haven't come about a compiler bug in recent GCC versions in ages. At worst, it was a crash, but at least it didn't generate the wrong code. So I think that is really something to be really thankful for. But you shouldn't forget what your compiler can and can't do. So that is what I want to show here. And compilers have uh, really improved a lot over the years. There's no question there. Um, but I don't feel it's a fundamental change. It's a stepwise change. But it doesn't change that some really trivial things where any person with basic knowledge of assembler goes, well, this obviously isn't how it should be. I mean, it's not that complicated what I'm trying to do here. It shouldn't generate a large amount of code for it. Uh, but compilers aren't like humans, as I said. They fail for trivial things sometimes because, well, they don't actually understand what you're doing. They're just following their rule set. So now to the first example. Um, I cut this down so um, you might not have that in actual real code. Uh, it's a really minimally cut down from things that happen in actual C++ code all the time. You have a simple struct. It contains of a 64-bit type and a 32-bit type, and you just initialize them both to zero uh, in a constructor. And then you have an array um, in global scope, fairly large. Um, and then the question is, what would you expect the compiler to do with this? Yes, that might be an option. Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, so that is actually a bit more advanced. For that, you need to know um, a bit about the whole structure. Um, and we'll actually see this case. Um, um, so let me just show what actually happens. This is the code that GCC generates for this. Um, so a bit explanation what it does. Um, here it gets the address of the array that it's going to initialize, and that is the end of the array it wants to initialize. Um, here it writes the 64-bit value. Um, here it increments the pointer to the next element, and then it in, uh, initializes the int one. So this is just an optimization that it does the addition before. Um, but in effect, the thing is that it actually does two writes here. It first writes the 64-bit element and then the 32-bit element, and then it also does the loop directly. Um, so assuming we're not changing this too much, what ways do you think this could have been done better by the compiler? So the thing is that um, this is compiled for 64-bit Intel. So there is, for example, an instruction with which it can write um, a whole 128 bits at once. So it could write um, 
these 64 bits and these 32 bits, and then it would also write into the padding, but the compiler can know that it's safe in this case, so it could do that. So these two could actually be done in one instruction together, and the compiler missed that one already, for example. And then there is also that in each loop iteration, it only initializes one single thing. Yes. Yes. So the question was for SIMD. Yes, that's what I was um, thinking about when I said it could write both of them with one instruction. That would be a SSE instruction, SIMD instruction, which can then really write 128 bits, all 16 bytes in one go. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to show in this presentation <laughs> that it could have done this. Um, so the question is what Clang does. Well, that is the next slide. Uh, but in some ways it's actually not interesting um, because that's what Clang does. <laughs> there is no code. Um, and in principle the whole function here is a no operation, uh, really, anyway. Because there is this so-called .bss. So this is where you, a special code, seg a special segment in your binary that uh, you, when your binary is loaded, will be initialized to zero automatically. And if your variable, I mean, there's an explicit dot zero, but that is actually not relevant. The std BSS means that your TMP variable will actually be initialized to zero just by simply starting your program. Of course, a challenge is that some systems might not actually have this kind of mechanism. So that is certainly a case where uh, Portable compilers might have more challenges, potentially. Um, but anyway, that's why no code is needed, because Langton says, oh, well, it's all supposed to be zero, so I don't need to do anything if it's already zero, by just putting it in the binary. Of course, the way this is not so interesting is because we can't actually figure out what Clang would have generated for an actually complicated case. But uh, we'll come to that. So, now actually, this makes things a bit simpler, even if it might not look so. Uh, let me just get back to the first example. So here we had a 64-bit type and a 32-bit type. The structure is going to be aligned to 64-bit, so there's basically unused 32 bits at the end here. And the thing here is to remove the unused 32 bits. That's essentially the only change. And suddenly, you see the SIMD instruction, a single one. This is interesting because it actually tells you what the compiler's problem was. It was confused by having padding in there. Somehow. No idea how, but uh, obviously that caused it issues. Um, but still, I mean, would you think this is actually good code, performance-wise? Yeah, okay, let's ignore that case. Let's assume it's not actually for initializing global variables, but something locally. So the comment was that the, this is not the longest write you can do with a single instruction. That is true, but um, I only uh, compiled for baseline 64-bit. So things like AVX or so that can write even double amount of that um, is not was not available. Um, so that, in fairness, I didn't even test. Um, so this was just baseline 64-bit Intel uh, op codes. No, I mean the big thing is that this loop is going to be run like uh, 128 times, and I mean two of your instructions are loop overhead, and only one instruction actually does useful work. This is a one to two ratio of useful work to overhead. If it just had done this one like four times or eight times, then that ratio would have gone up a lot. 
So that would have been an opti obvious optimization. Um, so that this was compiled with the optimization on? Yes, this was compiled with dash o3. Yeah, I mean, uh, the question was that there must be a consideration about code size compared to unrolling. Uh, yes, but I mean, these considerations are always there. Um, but I think the point is uh, a two to three ratio, double as much useless instructions as useful instructions. I think that I would say most people would agree is not on the realistic level. Yes. Uh, the point is optimizing for size. Yes, when optimizing for size, then uh, this, uh, though actually optimizing for size, there are even better ways to do it, uh, even smaller ways. Um, but yes, of course, depending on compiler options, if you tell it to optimize for size, it should pr uh, probably not do loop unrolling and so on. Um, Have you Uh, the question is, what if I had measured it? No, I actually have not measured the performance of these things. Um, in principle, um, one con thing to, even if it's, if in that case on some specific computer, uh, you would be able to saturate the memory bus with just this thing. Um, the thing is, the compiler can't know what you run it on, so. Even if you ran it on a system with a bigger memory bus, also this might easily fit in the L2 cache. So um, in that case, it, I don't think it actually can manage to saturate the bandwidth. But even if it does, I mean, there is still power. I mean, maybe it's most people don't care about it, but it's still overhead, power overhead to have uh, lots of instructions that don't do useful work in the end. But I mean, yes, the kind of thing like loop unrolling is something you definitely can discuss. That is not, uh, well, the compiler is doing something obviously silly. Um, but still, it can be a bit surprising. Um, so Clang is still the same, so no point in showing that. But now to another one. I mean, we did it really easy before. We just had uh, lots of zeros. Uh, so let's put a one in here in one place to just see what happens then. Um, so what do you think? Will this make a big difference? I mean, not for Clang, but for GCC, where it does the initialization anyway. So someone said no, but actually, I don't know how, but GCC got utterly confused. <laughs> um, so just to be clear, this is the end of the loop, and this here with L2 is the start of the loop. Um, and what happens here, this is where it sets up the pointers which, which you should initialize. But here, it sets the ECX register to one on every go through the loop. And all it does, it uses it here to write the one. So even though on the second loop iteration it will already be one, it will set it to one again. And the same, this is the XOR is just a way to set the register to zero. It will also set the register to zero every single loop. And let's not even talk about the fact that there's no point why it uses the register here. It could just have put the constant here directly. Um, but I won't promise that one, actually, because the instruction encoding for x86 is uh, very confusing. So I don't know if this specific 16-bit uh, write instruction actually can do the constants and so on. But uh, anyway, it still does the same we saw in the first one. It writes each of these separately, um, which, of course, comes down to the same thing. So this is 32-bit, 32-bit, make 64-bit, and another 32-bit from these two. Uh, makes uh, 96 bits, but, oh, it's actually not the same. I was thinking wrong. So it's actually, it doesn't have any padding like the first example. So it's actually not the padding that confuses it this time. 
Um, so Clang. This is also interesting, I think. Um, but you see that it gets a few more things right. Um, I just tried to explain what it does here. So here it writes the two integer values with one single 64-bit write, and here the two short values with one single 32-bit write. So it manages to actually merge the writes a little bit together. Um, and it also does the loop unrolling. So this is the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. So that means it reduces the loop overhead. So these things, at least, it gets right. Um, so a bit better, but it still doesn't use any SIMD instructions. It would be a bit more effort because the size of the struct is not a power of two, so it would have to unroll first unroll to a size that may, means that the overall number of writes is a multiple of the of the 128 bit of a single SIMD write, um, and then replace it. So that might be what it's actually tripping over. Uh, but still, I mean, it would be kind of obvious optimization. Um, so. Any other thoughts? <laughs> yes, uh, exactly, that's the part, yes. Um, so that one can be disputed because it actually makes the size of your binary larger. But since it's a global variable, there is actually a special section called the data. So the compiler could just actually write the actual data right into your, your binary and it would be loaded from disk, and then it would be just there. If that's better, it's quite up to discussion, so I won't really blame it on that. Uh, that might be intentional, actually. But it might be interesting to know that there are interesting lingo tricks that you actually can do that might be relevant. I'm not an expert on the C++ rules, but um, I mean, in this case, it knows fairly exactly what is going on and what effects it needs to have in the end. Because, yeah. Yes, if you put something like a printf in the constructor, then it can uh, has less of optimization possibilities. Or if there are other side effects in the constructor. So, so one thing I didn't try, for example, is of writing explicitly const expr for the uh, for the constructor. Uh, that would eliminate those concerns. But I think I tried it in the past, and it didn't really make any difference. So one thing about this class, uh, it is not trivially deconstructible. So it ha the compiler has to uh, think about what the constructor is doing. So it has to run that code in some sense. So the comment was that one thing is that there is an actual constructor that a compiler needs to look at and understand. Um. Okay, um, now we did a lot of initialization, but that's not all your program does, hopefully, um, though there is quite a lot of it in C++ programs sometimes. Um, so a different example is about assigning. Um, the case I wanted to test is just uh, when you really cop when a compiler copies around large amounts of code. Um, and the easiest way I thought of testing that was to make an STD array because an STD array actually makes a deep copy and you can just assign them to, assign them to cause a copy. Um, so this is a 60, 56 byte large struct here, but it doesn't really matter. It's just some struct that is trivially constructible, nothing weird going on here. And you have arrays of this with one element, with 100 elements, or with 500 elements. So that means from 56 bytes to um, around 2,000 something bytes that you, the compiler needs to copy for these functions. What do you think will be the most likely way the compiler will choose to implement this? Sorry? Yes, so the comment was mem copy. Um, any other ideas or ideas on what the difference will be, if there will be a difference between the different cases? <laughs> 
let's just look what happens. So this is the, the large size cases. Um, and yes, actually, it just does mem copy. Though it doesn't even call it, it optimizes it a little bit. Um, it just uh, sets up the arguments and does jump to mem copy. So the mem copy will actually be doing the return part. So saves an additional few instruction. Um, interesting case that goes a bit back to the platform thing. Uh, what do you think might be an advantage of using mem copy compared to it putting its own code? Comment was likely to be very well optimized. Yes, um, that is usually the case. Uh, further comments? Sorry. It Yes, so the comment was that it could have platform-specific optimizations that the, your binary cannot have. Yes, and actually it could be even optimizations that uh, didn't exist at the point when you compiled your code. Um, an interesting point for memcopy also on Linux at least is that um, this is not just replaced by a fixed function point or by a fixed function in the library, but there is actually really crazy stuff going on that when uh, your C library is being loaded, it doesn't just, the linker doesn't just pick the name address of the memcopy function. No, it actually calls another function, and that function actually calculates the real address of the memcopy. So what it can then do is at runtime, when your binary first starts up the first time, it does all the complex probing, what kind of system do you have, what kind of instructions are available, that takes quite some time, but it's okay because it's startup time. And then it decides, well, on this system, I actually want to use this specific um, memcopy implementation in my C library and not some generic one. And this has the advantage that you get a very optimized memcopy. Even with a generic Linux distribution, it will be one that is optimized to your specific computer. And it doesn't cost you an overhead for every single memcopy call. Um, how it figures out the perfect version of memcopy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it has a fixed num. This is not something that uh, that the compiler here does. It's something that your linker does by asking the C library which one it should use. And the C library. No, no. That um, the question is if that's based on the number of bytes of copy. No, this is being this selection is being done at the startup of your program, and it's for all memcopy invocations. So the memcopy still needs to be generic for all input values for all parameters, but it will be specific for your machine. Um, so now. Um, this is the small size version. Um, so here it does directly uh, the SIMD instructions. Um, which the reason for that is that the overhead for memcopy, I mean the memcopy is optimized, but it also means it does things like checking is the source aligned, is the destination aligned, and so on. And the overhead of that is, uh, is not so small. So uh, this is a good reason why it makes sense for it to actually not call memcopy for this smaller case. And you see that at least it does the SSE instruction and it doesn't copy the elements one by one, which I've also seen in some cases. Um, for Especially for assignment operators in C++, that sometimes happens that the compiler actually generates a single move instruction for every single byte or bool that you have in a class. Now let's go to GCC. This was all Clang. I swapped the order around this time. This is actually not so different. Uh, it's very subtle, actually, the difference. Um, what you have here is that it always does a read and then a write and then a read and a write. And also, this is called unaligned moves because the compiler isn't sure um, if that starts at a 
specific boundary if your array you're copying starts at a 32-byte boundary or not. So it chooses to use the underlined. However, GCC actually figured out since it allocated the arrays itself, it actually made sure to align it, so it actually uses the aligned moves. So here GCC actually was a bit more clever in how it placed your data structures in your binary and also how it then copies them. Um, but it's also interesting that it chooses to do first all the reads and then all the writes. Which in theory, the way I learned it is better because that means if this read takes a long time, you still do first useful work and then you actually need the result for the write. But I won't actually touch on that because I'm not 100% sure how it looks on all the different implementations of x86. But you see, at least see that compilers do different decisions on how they implement things, even if they in principle do the same thing. More interesting is the GCC for the large size, which looks less nice. Um, so for example, it doesn't actually optimize the whole stack frame away. So it creates the stack frame and it does an actual call and it has to do the return and doesn't do the jump. I'm not sure about if that's intentional or a bug, it's at least not optimal. Um, but it could be that for debug reason they decided, well, we want to leave this in. But on the other hand, if you choose O3 for optimization, do you really need that kind of debug information that it called this function that really didn't do anything? And then there is this weird web move SQ function. So this is a very special uh, instruction. What it does, it takes this register, the value in there 700, and it does a move from this to this address, this 700 times. It's one instruction that does 700 actual instructions. Now, I at first thought this is going to be horrible, but then I actually read up and I found out, well, sometimes this one is really, really optimized and it's fairly close or exactly as good as the best hand optimized code you can write. But sometimes it's also rather bad. So I guess it depends on your luck on which computer you run it on, if this is actually good or not. So sometimes you actually come across things where you think, that's really stupid. What does a compiler do there? And sometimes it's then actually because the compiler writers knew more about the architectures than you did. That happens as well, of course. It's possible if you tell the compiler um, which specific architecture it should optimize for that it would um, then generate different code. I haven't actually tested that out. It's also possible that this was just something from the good old times that someone implemented that way and it kind of got stuck because nobody changed the compiler. If you do compile with ABX, a, 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 you can't run it on a computer without ABX, for instance. If you tell the compiler to... Ch it's for Surf Studio, at least. Uh, yes, exactly. So if you tell the compiler that it can use advanced instructions like AVX, then you can't run a con on a computer without it, yes. Yes. So that's why I'm not blaming the compiler. I'm not using any of those instructions here. So that is because of my compile options. Of course, that would be also an interesting thing to test. Um, but to be honest, um, that is a bit architecture specific, but I think I won't be blaming AV the compiler for not using AVX because the fact is that it makes your CPU actually run at a much lower frequency. And that balancing, if you actually win more from the larger instructions or lose more from the slower CPU clock. I think that is a bit as much to ask the compiler to decide. Um, so this is a kind of architecture choice that I always think. I'm not sure these com people really know what compilers actually do and what kind of choices they can make for you. Or it's just things that were never meant for the compiler to actually use. That's also possible. 
Sorry, I didn't. I, I'm asking about just-in-time compilers for C++ <laughs> because that, that, this is a thing. Like a, uh, like a result, um, oh. Having, like, Okay, okay. And so the question was about uh, if there are just in time compilers um, for C that would avoid this issue by um, being able to generate code specific for your platform. Um, um, not something in production use, at least, I think. The big problem is, especially for C, I think, the massive compile time. So, um, especially the worst case compile time and possibly worse uh, memory usage. Um, so, that is a bit questionable if you really want to pay that price. So, I think generally in C++, the solution to that is, well, just ship the source code and have someone compile it for their machine if they really want to optimize it that much. Um, I mean, there have been things like for C in the old times, uh, but that is, was a different use case, something called TCC, Tiny C Compiler. Uh, it actually could run C like uh, shells, like a script. So you could run C as a script. And it could actually, someone demonstrated, it could use the Linux, boot the Linux kernel from source code. Um, so that is kind of a direction, but it was really not optimizing. So that is kind of different direction of where you were going. The big advertisement was it can compile, I think, like 20 megabytes per second, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, another example is uh, signed arithmetic. Um, what do you think is the, actually the difference between these? It's actually kind of a trick question because I have originally thought there was a difference, but uh, there actually isn't really one. <laughs> um, these should essentially produce the same effect. Um, the point they are trying to show is that there's a thing called signed overflow. So you multiply here the signed value with two. Um, and multiplying a signed value, if it overflows, so if it's larger than the data type it fits into, which would be int, then that's undefined behavior. So the compiler can do whatever it wants in that case, or it can assume that case won't happen, or things like that. So that is relevant because this multiplication is 32-bit, and this one is 64-bit. So if you were to do it really, really strict, you would really have to do a 32 multiplication here and make sure that the result isn't more than 32 bit. If any bits overflowed, you need to cut them off. And then, only then, can you do that multiplication that then has more than 32 bits. But thanks to signed overflow, the compiler doesn't have to care about that case and can actually just do both multiplications in 64 bits. And the interesting thing is that GCC does this Kind of. There is some complications involved because, um, uh, well, let's not go into details, but essentially um, this is a left shift by two, so this one is a multiplication by four. Um, and this is when it does two times an integer converting to sine 64 bit and then uh, multiply by two. So there the compiler just merges two multiplications. But if instead you change here the type from signed to unsigned, it for some reason decides to split the two multiplications. Um, x86 has like a million ways to do a multiplication by two. So um, this is a multiplication by four. This is a multiplication by two. This is a multiplication by two. This is a multiplication uh, by two. And this is a multiplication by two. <laughs> Just in case you didn't recognize them. Um, and the last one is just array indexing. Um, so this is an array with elements that have size 2. So that's where the second multiplication by 2 comes. Because you want to go from the index to the actual address, you have to multiply the index by the size of the element. Um, and this is the factor 2 here. Yeah, uh, but yes, that means that unfortunately your loop indexing, your indexing into an array is not as good as it could be.
because the compiler can't figure out that actually it could just change this to a four and then get rid of the add instruction. And we can't really blame GCC on this because Clang doesn't do it ever. Um, which of course some people might say, well, I'm happy that my compiler doesn't use undefined behavior against me. <laughs> but um, yeah. Can you, can you tell that both of them does it if you do it within loops? So it's the loop optimizations that does this kind of transformation. <laughs> okay, that's so, uh, Yeah, so yes, I guess that's the danger of cutting down your test cases. You sometimes might then fall into the cases that all the compiler implementers decided, well, there's no point in optimizing that because nobody actually does that or it's not relevant for performance. Um, but still, um, can be a bit surprising. Um, bit different topping. Multiplication. Um, so, uh, maybe I should just say what it's about. Um, the thing is that this first one is a fairly simple multiplication with 16-bit uh, to 8-bit and the result is 16-bit. Um, and here I changed both types to 8-bit input types and that means that the result can be at most 16-bit. Uh, which is relevant because that means that this whole casting to 64-bit really doesn't matter because it's all going to fit into 16-bit as well. So if anything, this one should be simpler than this one, purely what it does. Unfortunately, um, I actually decided to do something a bit different for this one because um, microcontrollers, 8-bit microcontrollers are always interesting to use a compiler on. Um, so this is an 8-bit microcontroller, um, which makes things a bit more complicated. Uh, and it always also has only multiplication for multiplying two 8 bits and getting a 16 bit out. And that's what it does in the first case. So it does uh, multiply, um, which way around, the low bit of the 16 bit value with the 8 bit one and the high bit of the 16 bit value um, with the 8 bit one. And then it adds the high, uh, the, the high results together to get the proper final output. Um, so that is basically the right way to do it. It's quite fine. It used to be a lot worse because um, when I first started using 8-bit microcontrollers, it sometimes decided, well, let's first convert them all to 16-bit and then do all the possible multiplications. So it ended up creating four multiplications and then a lot of additions. And most of those multiplications and additions were multiplication with zero and additions of zeros. So this is actually already improved. Um, unfortunately, adding a symbol cast completely throws it off the track. Uh, it doesn't somehow seems to forget that the input originally was an 8-bit value, just because you cast, cast it to a 32-bit value. Um, and then it decides, well, I'll have to expand both inputs that are 8-bit to 16-bit, and then I'll call the library function that does a 16 times 16 to 32-bit multiplication. Which on a real microcontroller means that suddenly your code size is a lot bigger and your speed is like, I don't know, 30 times slower than before. So if you ever wonder why people working with microcontrollers don't like to use compilers and sometimes just implement things in assembler, this is it. Because your code suddenly getting 30 times slower, maybe because you upgrade your compiler, it's really painful. <laughs> But admittedly, this is a bit of a problem because it's a very special architecture and you can't expect compilers to be 100% optimized. Um, interesting for Clang, um, it also doesn't see that those are actually the same thing. This looks a bit weird because the multiplication instruction on x86 has so many limitations, so that's why it needs to do one move into the proper location at the end here. Um, but here it could actually use exactly the same code and it would even get the 64-bit register probably with zeros on top and everything. Uh, but it still thinks it needs to do a 64-bit multiplication. Um, and this is kind of the same thing for, for GCC. The difference is um, 
essentially nothing relevant. So, but on the topic of different architectures, and this one time not a completely weird one, ARM. Let's try what it does on ARM. Wait, what? Why does it two, do two ends? I mean, the multiplication instruction isn't so weird. It has two sources and a destination. So it doesn't need to do any moves or anything. But suddenly it decides it needs to mask up away the upper bits. And it decides to use a 64-bit multiplication, which also is a waste of power, if nothing else. So one thing I thought, well, maybe it's because the ABI specifies that if you have a 16-bit, 8-bit uh, argument, that actually the upper bits are undefined, so you actually have to mask everything. This seems utterly crazy, but crazier things have happened. So now I try Clang. Well, it actually doesn't mask one of the inputs. So obviously there is no need to mask off the, the high bits of the input arguments. But it still does it in three out of four cases. I have no idea what is going on here. <laughs> but that kind of thing can happen to you, especially if you're not on x86. Yes? Any thoughts or comments? <laughs> No, I mean, uh, the question is if there's a way to make the compiler do the right stuff. Uh, I could, of course, I could say, well, you can write it in assembler. <laughs> uh, but, um, no, not really. Um, of course, for things like SIMD, when you have a lot of data, you might want to look into intrinsics. Nowadays, it actually halfway works. Um, in the past, it was like that you wrote your code with intrinsics. So intrinsics are basically functions that do the same stuff as the highly optimized instructions of the processor. Um, what it actually would do, though, that it decided to just randomly push your stuff on the stack and then read it again from the stack for no reason. And it actually was lower than the non-optimized version. <laughs> uh, but that seems to be mostly fixed. So that is one way. So, But it's still like write a sampler in that case. Uh, Pragmas for SIMD uh, was the question. I actually don't know uh, anything I mean, about the reason the intrinsic function with the uh, uh, SIM Pragmas in OpenMP for zero MPI. Uh, so this is some OpenMP stuff for SIMD? Okay, I don't know about that, oh. uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, OpenMP, if you can use it and if it works, is really nice. So I can recommend looking into that, uh, especially for parallelization. But I don't know the SIMD parts of it. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, of, well, I mean, the thing is, it's sometimes worth to look at what your compiler generates. And sometimes you can just randomly fiddle with the code and think the compiler will figure it out. Like with the thing with the padding in your structure. It's possible that you just make sure there's no padding in your structure and suddenly your compiler manages to do it right. Or here, for example, probably if you had changed all the input, all the argument types to int, it probably would have solved all the ending here. But I mean, the next compiler could come and then decide um, it, they could fix this. And then the compiler actually needs to do a 32, 32 to 64 bit multiplication because you actually wrote it like that uh, when your original code would then actually be faster. So these kind of things are usually compiler specific. Mm, so the comment was on only using int and standard types like that. I mean, one thing you can take away from this is probably be careful with casts because they, for some reason, seem to completely confuse the compiler. Um, 
And of course, that also means that not using the specific types can be helpful. It can also be helpful for other reasons, like you saw the optimization for the signed overflow. So if you use an int type, then the compiler can actually use the signed overflow thing to optimize it. Um, so I guess the, my feeling is that using int types often works out fairly well. But of course, it will be very bad if you then want to use uh, SIMD instructions to, to optimize, to do more work in one instruction. Yeah. Just one thing. <laughs> Alarm. Yeah. Also, tell you how, like, if yeah, comment was that there are compiler tools to tell you about the padding. Uh, for GCC, I think there is also a warn warning flag that will print you whenever it uh, adds padding. Though I think it's usually more for the for when you have many things in your struct to make sure there's no internal padding. That's probably what they're more aimed for because this is the common optimization thing. Uh, but it probably works also for padding at the end. Of course, there's also the question what you're aiming for because um, the value of keeping the elements in your struct in a logical order might outweigh any optimization advantage you can get from reordering things. So you always have to think what is the right uh, choice here. And it was actually the last slide. Um,